Hey, this week's video will be a bit different. It'll be a Q&A special. It's thanks to everyone who's helped my channel reach 100,000 subscribers, which is absolutely surreal. It's happened so quickly. So thank you to everyone who's taken the time to follow along and watch my videos. Over on my Instagram, I asked you guys what kind of questions you'd like to hear me answer. And there are literally hundreds of responses. So I'll definitely have to make another one of these videos in the future. So I just chose a dozen or so which I liked and I'll respond to those in today's video. So let's begin. Minipot asks, how do you find time to make your work and maintain two very active social platforms? Ceramics is so much work and running your business is so much work and administration and then on top of it also, basically being a ceramic influencer. Do you have any studio assistants? Well, I don't really. It's just me in the studio. I'm entirely a one man operation apart from my accountant. So I do all the pottery, all the filmmaking, all the photography, everything. And it is, like you imagine, a huge amount of work. Really, and I've said this before, the amount of social media I do definitely quantifies as a second job. So not only am I working all day, but when I get home, I'll generally spend a couple of hours editing, responding to comments, replying to emails, and that kind of thing. And then usually I spend Saturday editing and recording the audio for these YouTube videos. And for those of you who don't follow me on other platforms, YouTube is really just sort of one side of what I do. I've only been making videos like this for less than a year now, but over on Instagram I've been posting videos and photos every day now for more than six years without ever missing a day. So like I have mentioned previously too, if you want to see what I'm up to every single day then I definitely suggest that you head over to my Instagram and follow there as well. But to answer the question, no, it's just me. And this leads nicely onto the next question, which is left by Sam J Dowling. Would you like to, or do you think you will ever take on apprentices in the future? Now, this is a question I'm asked all the time. Each week I probably receive 20 to 30 emails from people asking if they can come and be an intern or to do longer apprenticeships. And the simple answer is, at the moment, no, I'm not looking for any help, but in the future, I may very well, and I would like to. Truthfully speaking, I've only really been running my own business by myself for just coming up to two years. And by that I mean running my own studio and having all my own equipment and doing it properly, properly by myself. And I still feel as if I have a huge amount to learn in regard to running that business. So I don't know if I would really be that confident yet having someone that I have to look after, to pay, to teach. I think I'm still quite young. At the time of recording this, I'm 28. So I really think I need another few years to really get to grips with running my business and my pottery before I begin searching for a full-time assistant or apprentice. But in regard to if I think it's a beneficial way of learning, like Sam said, it was the way I learned with Lisa Hammond for three years and then with Ken Matsuzaki for six months. And without question, those years were the most valuable years of my life in regard to not only honing my skills, but also seeing how a business is run from the inside out. Things like how to run a studio, how to teach classes, how to efficiently pack and ship off your work. There are so many other things beyond just making pots that you need to learn to run a pottery business. And being able to experience what that's like without any of the financial worry can be unbelievably useful. So I recognise that I was quite lucky with my apprenticeships. So in the future, I definitely want to pass on the skills I've learned in a similar way. Cheryl Tang asks, do you feel lonely? since you work by yourself. And I would say at the moment, no, I actually relish in it. For my entire ceramic education, since I was about 17, I worked in busy studios with lots of people. And while of course it is lovely spending time with people you like, to bounce ideas off, to be inspired by, and to ask questions, what comes with this is a battle for space, so to speak. Be it storing your own pots, your clay, who can be in what area at what time, and then there's kiln scheduling and everything like that. So in regard to all of that, I actually like having my own space where there's no schedule that I need to conform to. I can make what I want, put it where I want, listen to the music that I want to listen to and film whenever I want without the worry of other noises interrupting. But who knows, this might change in the future. Nicole Dacey asks, I would love to know about filming and photos, specifically things about making video and photographs look similar. Is it just about buying a better camera? Is it editing? How are you able to film so many hours of content? Where does it get stored? And so on. And I'll answer this bit by bit. 
I actually struggled for a long time too, trying to get my videos to look as good as my photographs. And I suppose equipment does make a big difference. I was shooting photographs with very low depth of field for a long time, and I was filming with higher ones, so there was sort of a mismatch there. So it took me filming with much lower f-stops to sort of match my photography. I am entirely self-taught when it comes to using a camera, and if you scroll back far enough on my Instagram, you'll see the difference. Like anything, taking photographs and filming is a skill, so it does take time and a huge amount of practice. But as for the equipment I use, I'm currently filming with a Canon 5D Mark IV with either a 50mm Sigma art lens, which is a 1.4, and a 100mm macro, which is a 2.8 f-stop and that's the one I want to upgrade next. I have a light which I can control the warmth on which helps me to get the correct colour for when I'm filming and then I do a tiny amount of colour correction when I'm editing the film and believe it or not I'm still using iMovie so it's incredibly simple software but there's not actually a lot that I do to my videos anyway so I get by for now. Then as to how I film so many hours of content, well I just have my camera up on a tripod basically at all times so if there's something interesting I'm doing, I just point it in the right direction and film. The most annoying aspect of that is that I'm constantly switching between filming landscape footage and portrait footage. Landscape obviously for YouTube and portrait for things like Instagram and TikTok. But like anything, again, it's practice, so the more you do it, the faster you get. Then as for storing footage, I currently just have a bunch of hard drives ranging from two terabytes to eight terabytes. And this is really where one of the main throttles in my production comes up, as the amount of footage that I film just eats up so much space. And it's why actually I don't film in 4K at the moment, because that just takes it to another level and I would need just endless hard drives and a computer that's powerful enough to edit 4K footage easily. So there is sort of a financial limit to filming in both, you know, you need a computer that's powerful enough and you need ample storage space and it gets very expensive very quickly, especially when I'm filming hours of content usually every day in the range of 50 gigabytes to 250 gigabytes. And just if anyone else is interested for editing all my photographs and things like that, I use Photoshop and Lightroom and occasionally Viesco on my phone. Next up is a question from Seaweed Cuisine who asks, do you get bored? With the exact repetition or is it meditative? And I suppose it's somewhat a mixture of the two. I do love throwing big batches of pots. I enjoy the challenge of making them all identical and say if I'm throwing 30 beakers I see it almost as one body of work as opposed to 30 individual pieces. I enjoy the physicality of throwing quickly. I enjoy breaking down the process into as few distinct movements as possible and it is almost relaxing in some kind of way when I'm throwing but my mind is completely elsewhere, such as listening to the audiobook that's playing or a podcast or music, and I just allow my muscle memory to get things done. Yet there are other times, of course, when I'm coming to the end of a batch and I just want to get finished as quickly as possible to go home or to throw something else. So it ebbs and flows. I find some days are better than others for throwing repetitively. It really just depends what I'm up to. FF6600 asks, I'm always struck how you narrate your work process. How do you approach the narration of your videos? Do you improvise it mainly? And the answer is yes, they are entirely improvised. There's no script or anything. I just try to say useful things about what's happening on screen. And a video of mine that's about 30 minutes or so long will probably have around about a thousand individual audio takes. It can take me a long time to say something in the way I like it, but I am getting better with time and I've really never been a very good public speaker. But hey, at least these videos are practice. Ruth asks, I'd love to know how you make sure the whole business aspect of being an artist doesn't overwhelm you. Did you follow classes, have a mentor, or figure it out on your own? The only actual business classes I've ever had were a few on the DCCOI Ceramic Skills and Design Training course, and that was quite a long time ago. And beyond that, I've never taken any classes or anything like that. I've pretty much just learned everything as I go along. And whilst I'm a pretty good potter, I think, and proficient at making social media too, I'm not a naturally good business person. I never went out actively thinking about the best ways of making money, simply I just wanted to make pots. I think that's probably the approach by most studio potters. Their love of the craft and how much joy they take from simply making and doing is always the most important thing, but I guess of course you can't ignore the business side of things. 
there's a part of me that toys with the idea of really scaling up my business with more than 1.3 million followers across all my social media platforms. I alone can probably never keep up with demand. So part of me thinks that I should hire employees, find a bigger space, purchase more kilns and become something bigger altogether. But I know that wouldn't suit me. I prefer making small batches of work and being one person as opposed to a larger brand, which I suppose feeds into this question nicely. Daniel Strassler asks, is there a final goal to this journey of yours in the pottery world? A price point that you would wish to get or a sum of pots you wish to sell? There isn't a specific amount I'd like to sell or a certain price. I'd like to be financially secure, perhaps enough so that I can take on a few apprentices and teach them and pay them fairly as well. And while I do have a studio that I love at the moment, I think a long-term goal is to find a much larger space outside of the city where I can have gas kiln, a soda kiln, a salt kiln, and maybe even a wood kiln too. So I guess that's one of my goals. And I suppose another would be reaching a certain level of mastery. There are certain potters that I watch online or I've met in real life whose level of skill just blows me away. And one day I would love to be at that point too. But who knows what will happen. I really hope I don't burn out and that I'm able to enjoy this craft long into my life. Rainer Mast asks, how do you take care of your body, specifically back and neck? Have you ever tried a standing wheel or have a preference for wheel height? Well, for wheel height and table height for my workbench, I suppose that's one of the good things about having your own workshop. My workbench is made to the correct height for me to wedge on, and my wheel is obviously adjusted for my height too. The wheel that I currently use, which is a Rhoda HMT 500, is really comfortable, and it has a seat that leans forward slightly, which means my back isn't too hunched most of the time. I also use a mirror whenever I throw, which is directly opposite the wheel, and it means that I can see a perfect side view of any pot I'm throwing or trimming, without having to lean back awkwardly, or get off the wheel and stop constantly, which really helps. Truthfully though, I haven't really tackled any proper pain yet. My back may ache a tiny bit after a long day's work, but I've never had any long lasting pain. And the same goes for my hands. Sometimes they do feel a bit stiff after a long day, but a little bit of stretching and really they feel fine. I do know of potters who experience back and neck pain and in their studios they've set up a bar which they can hang on, stretching everything out. But beyond that, I really can't give any advice. I'm not an expert, but I'm sure there are potters out there who are. So if you do have any advice, maybe leave a comment down below. I'm sure some of you know some good techniques to alleviate any pain. Udform asks about my name. Is it a family name? Is there a story there? If I were to write a detective story, I would want to name the main character Florian Gadsby. Sounds intriguing. Well, this one's pretty easy to answer. My first name, Florian, comes from Florian Schneider from the legendary band Kraftwerk, who helped invent electronic music, and Gadsby comes from Gaddesby, which was a Saxon settlement in England, in Lancashire, that's mentioned in the Doomsday Book. All that being said, I am British. People often think that I'm either German or French, and sometimes Romanian, simply because of my name, but no. My parents were just very inventive. Emma's Ceramics asks, how do you balance between a pressure to produce a certain amount of pieces to earn money and still being a creative and free artist? I think one thing to remember is that I do to some degree really enjoy making tableware like this. It may occasionally be somewhat monotonous, but tableware is what drew me to ceramics initially. And part of me wants to keep making it, at least for the time being, as I know there are so many people who want it. The people who watch my videos here and support me on Instagram and have done so for more than six years. I wouldn't be here without all of you, I don't think. Nor would I be able to make as freely as I can, actually. So I don't feel as if there's pressure for me to keep churning out mugs and bowls. Moreover, it's a really nice feeling knowing that there are people out there who really want your pots. To look after them, to use them, to hold them. So I am happy to create these pieces over and over again for the people who have been underpinning me and helping me all this time. And even so, I do have plenty of time to make the pots I want to make. But of course, there is still a balance that you need to hit. Famfear Not Chloe asks, Compare between social medias, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, TikTok. Which ones do you consider most suitable for one who wants to start a pottery career today? There's a lot to discuss here, and I think it's worth remembering that you could probably make any four of those platforms work really well for you, if you put in the time. Although there are other things to consider, such as which audience on which platform is the most likely to support and buy your work. As fundamentally, that's what you need. 
if you want to use the social media platform for your career to build a name and to sell your work. And then you also need to consider how much time you're willing to invest into creating content for the platforms. So in my opinion, I think the easiest to create content for and the one with the best buying audience is Instagram. The age demographic that follows pottery related content seems to be higher than other platforms such as YouTube and TikTok, which means they generally have a more expendable income, which means they're more likely to buy your pottery. TikTok followers, which I have the most of, some 700 and something thousand, follow very easily, but I think the audience there is really much too young to be interested in actually spending money on ceramics. But it can be a very good platform to funnel followers to both Instagram and YouTube. And then there's YouTube itself, which I'm still getting to grips with really. I've only been actively posting here for less than a year, but already the amount of clicks from YouTube to my website easily outweighs both Instagram and TikTok combined. And the people who do watch your videos and are actually committed to following you are probably the people spending the most time engaging with your content. So in some ways I feel like they know you the most, if that makes sense. But then again also, YouTube is easily the platform which requires the hardest work, as consistently filming, editing and making videos eats up hours and hours. But then again, if you are able to make a success of YouTube, it can really pay off in ways other social media platforms can't. YouTube does nowadays practically cover all of the running costs of my studio, which I honestly never thought would happen. So back to the question, which was which is the most suitable for those who want to start a pottery career today. I would say start with Instagram and build a following there. And then you want to branch out. I don't think you ever want to put all your apples in one basket. And both TikTok and YouTube especially are really useful tools. And maybe Facebook is too, but personally, I really dislike using it. The user interface is horrible. There's way too many options and tabs and tiny details that clutter every inch of your screen. And to some degree, I think the followings there are never quite as genuine as they are in other places. But I might be wrong, and I'm sure some of you will prove me so in the comments below. But for one final piece of advice about using social media, you also don't want to spread yourself too thin. Quality always trumps quantity. And for any potters starting out on their journey, who are seriously looking into using social media to aid their process, I would say just be careful and consider that what's probably more important are your own actual skills. Invest in your own ability and become the best ceramicist you can, as your skills will last forever, and social media very well may not. And I think this question is a good follow-up to that. Lisa asks, did you plan to go this big when you started? Is success a scary thing? And did commitment nurture your love to ceramics? So I never started Instagram back in 2014 with the intent of gaining lots of followers. Really, it was just a way to keep my friends and family updated about the apprenticeship I was doing with Lisa Hammond. And very quickly, my following started to grow and snowball. And I think it's important to remember that back in those early days, Instagram was still relatively small. There were 100 million users as opposed to 1.2 billion or however many there are these days and there really wasn't that many potters posting online about what they do especially every day like i was doing but as soon as i saw that people were continuing to follow and people liked my content and the photos i posted of my pots i just kept doing it i think it is much harder these days to break out as there are simply so many people you have to compete with but that isn't to say it's impossible and i've seen some huge success stories even in the last couple of years. But yes, I never thought I would have 100,000 subscribers, let alone half a million on Instagram and almost a million on TikTok. And who really knows what that all means? Is success scary? Well, I wouldn't say so in this small world that is ceramics. It can be overwhelming at times, just the sheer amount of people trying to get in touch with you. And I did used to reply to every message, every email, but nowadays if I did that, I probably wouldn't have any time to make pottery itself. So I do try and set boundaries. And if I receive a message or an email that really is very low effort, or I can tell they're not really that interested, I just have to delete it or move on because I would just be on my phone or on my computer 24 seven. And of course that isn't a negative thing. It's just being overwhelmed. Otherwise success is fun. I've met some really cool people and I've made some great friends and I get to do what I love for a living, which I guess leads on to the end part of your question, which was, did commitment nurture your love to ceramics? And the answer to that is simply yes. The more I do it, the more I enjoy it. The feeling of getting better and of learning especially feels so good. 
and the years I spent in college or with Lisa Hammond or with Ken Matsuzaki really were unforgettable and they were probably the most enjoyable periods of my life as I had the chance to not only experience the style of pottery I like but numerous others too and opportunities that I may never see again. Celia drinks coffee, asks, what's your favourite thing to listen to while you work? So I'll give you three things here. There's an awful lot I could say, so I'll give you an audiobook, a podcast, and an album. I'm a huge sci-fi fan, and I recently finished Andy Weir's Project Hail Mary, which if you like The Martian, I'm sure you'll really like this too. As for a podcast, I'd have to say it's the Adam Buxton podcast, which I've been listening to quite religiously for years now, since the XFM days. And even though he annoys me sometimes and speaks over his guests, he basically feels like a member of the family. So, and lastly, an album. And trust me, there are millions that I could choose from, but the one I've had on repeat most recently is the Toshio Matsuro Group with the album Love Play Dance, Eight Scenes from the Floor. And I won't say anything more about that. You'll just have to listen to it. I'll leave a link to each of these three in the description below. Joe Walker asks, What are your views on art versus craft? Do you consider yourself an artist or a craftsman? I guess this is the age-old question. It's been stewing in the ceramics community for a very long time now. The difference between an artist and a potter, and which one, if I had to choose, would I label myself as? And really, I'd say I'm quite fluid. I consider myself an artist, a potter, a ceramicist, a maker, a craftsperson, all of those things. Yes, I take a lot of pride in craftsmanship and skill and ability, but I don't think being focused on those things should differentiate myself from being an artist either. And I suppose myself as a maker, not only do I make pots, but I also write about them. I film the process. I take photographs of them. There are so many different facets to my profession. So these days, honestly, I don't think about it all too often. If others want to argue to decide which term is best and which we should all be labelled as, they can do that. I'll just happily keep making and call myself whatever I feel like. I think I make pottery that has both skillful and artistic merit. And after all, where do you draw the line? Carly Sadri asked, How did you make the transition into selling for profit? Did you do in-person craft and art fairs? Do you remember how you felt making your first sale? I suppose my entry into the ceramics world was a little bit peculiar. If we take this question based off when did I sell my ceramic work properly after college and school, then really, I didn't have my first online sale until I had maybe about 70,000 Instagram followers. So I remember setting my shop to go live, and the pieces literally sold out within a minute or two. And I was completely shocked. I was shaking. I was nervous. I had no idea whether my pots would sell or not. And I was almost even more shocked that they did. But thankfully, during these first couple of online sales, I was still an apprentice for Lisa Hammond. So I could use the gas kiln and the equipment without any real financial burden. And the fact that I'd already built an Instagram audience that was interested in my work meant that I never really struggled to sell it. And I suppose thereafter, I've always sold my work for profit. As for attending craft fairs and things, I've never done one personally. I went to lots with Lisa when I was her apprentice, helping to set up, sell pots, and so on. And generally, they were always really fun events, especially when my friends who are potters attended. And just seeing the breadth of work that's out there is really quite amazing. As for whether I'll do any myself in the future, with my own work, I can't say. I've sort of built a model for selling my work already, so I kind of want to continue down that path for the time being. Which leads nicely to this question by Holly. Do you have any tips on how to obtain your pots when the shop sells out in minutes? So let me preface this for those who don't know. Maybe about three or four times a year, I have a big online shop restock. Each one normally consists of about three to 500 pieces, and I'd say it usually sells out unbelievably in under 10 minutes, which, believe me, I never thought would be the case in a million years. And had I known that that's how I would be selling my work when I started out on my pottery path, I most certainly wouldn't have believed it. But there are some tips I can give you. They may be kind of obvious, but hopefully they'll help you obtain a piece. The first is to have your browser remember your payment details, such as Apple Pay or something like that. Then there's the obvious, be on the website the minute it goes live, and what I know some people do is they take my URLs for different items such as mugs and bowls and they input those directly into their browsers so they're not wasting any time looking through the shop. So they go straight to the things they want. 
Otherwise, that's all the advice I have really. Ultimately, it comes a bit down to luck, as usually when the shop is updated, there's maybe about 10,000 people on the website. And I have really thought about this selling process a lot, and having a system that is first come, first serve is still the fairest one that I can think of. It's also the easiest for a one-man operation. It means I get my shops over and done with, and I can get back to making again, rather than continually juggling, making and firing, and shipping, and making, and shipping. This way, I do all my making, all my glazing, all my firing, and then all my shipping. And then I repeat that process again. And this way it feels the most streamlined. Myla's Apothecary asks, I'd love to know your sage advice for someone starting out. Things to avoid, must-dos, any pearls of wisdom, really. There's an awful lot I could reply to this with. Truth be told, it can be hard starting out. Knowing which direction to take, what sort of work to make, how to start your business, and so on. I think one thing that's sort of being overlooked quite a lot these days is the investment into one's skills. And I don't want to sound like a broken record, as I did speak about this earlier too. But really investing in your own practical ability, if you want to make pots, can put you leaps and bounds ahead of people that don't. Once you achieve a certain level of technical ability, it really does give you so much fluency when it comes to making pots. So doing things like attending master classes, trying out as many different firing and making techniques as you can, and really broadening the range of your technical ability before you decide to focus on something can be so important. And I think perhaps these days, pottery is almost even kind of romanticized a bit. So beginners will often focus immediately on their Instagram rather than focusing on their skills. And while of course, social media can be important for running your business, during the start, it should never undermine your learning. And while you are learning, it's fine to copy other people, to try and imitate the work you like, to slowly try and find your voice. But there does come a point where you should really try to actively not copy what you see around you. It's so easy to be inspired these days, with Instagram at your fingertips and millions of photographs and videos of pots so easily accessible. But when the time comes to building your own style, it can help to take a step back and actively make things that aren't obviously copying anyone else, especially if you're trying to sell it. You'll only stand out more if your work is different, rather than joining a cacophony of pots that all look the same. And of course, all of that is much easier said than done, but you might be surprised by just how many people I see online. And these are small individual makers who literally just find something they like on Instagram and copy it exactly. So try to be unique, try to be different. If you are using social media as a tool, really try to be unique and have a narrative too. People follow people rather than brands and corporate businesses. So as long as you're engaging and happen to make pots that people like too, then it's quite easy to be successful, I think. Or perhaps my view is warped after all these years. Who knows, at any rate. It's a topic that I could probably make a whole long video about, so I'll leave it at that. And finally, The Muddies asks, Hi Florian, do you use your own pottery in your kitchen? Only a few pieces, really. The majority of the pots that I have, especially plates, mugs and bowls, are either pieces made by potters I aspire to and really love, pieces that I've bought over the years and have slowly accumulated into my collection, and the other pots I use are ones made by my friends. As cheesy as that sounds, it is, in all honesty, really nice using a mug that a really close friend has made. You grip the vessel via the handle that was pulled and is shaped into their hand, and handmade pots to some degree do sort of encompass a person. It's a pot that's made in their aesthetic, with their ideals, their care and attention, or their playfulness, or their supreme level of craftsmanship. There's a connection, and for instance, all the mugs that I have that were made by my friends on the DCCOI Ceramic Skills and Design course in Ireland always remind me of that time whenever I use them. And I suppose that sort of encapsulates why I'm in this craft to begin with. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this kind of video. If you'd like more question and answer style videos in the future, do let me know down in the comments. This was fun to put together and it makes for a welcome change compared to my regular uploads. And once again, a huge thanks to everyone who's helped my channel surpass 100,000 followers. Here's to many more milestones in the future, and many more videos too. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.